Let's go. So, everybody, how's your day been? Good, thank been you. Good. How's Bye. yours, mate? Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sound, sound as a pound, mate. Um, anybody got any stories to tell about anything on the day? So, I've been working on the next batter up. Fantastic. Mainly doing graphics for Tau. Which has been fun. Who, who, who's in the next bat rep, Scott? Uh, the next bat rep is Cam and Ben, and that should be coming on Sunday. Hype, hype. Ian, don't scratch your beard. <laughs> can you hear it? <laughs> yeah, it's you too, can proper it's hear too it. too noisy. Stop it. Right, so uh, <clears throat> nobody else got any anecdotes, anything interesting no, to say um, for the day? No, I've just been to work and painted a bit more of my own curses um, when I got back. Um, just hoping to get everything looking beautiful and finished in time for mine and Scott's batter up. Yeah. Not got much to do now, though. No, I've not. I've got one. I've got one thing I'm working on. Ian, do you know what it is? No, but you're going to show me. Oh, oh, oh! Is it Martarian? Oh yes, son. Oh, did you really drop him? him. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah, he looks mint, mate. Yeah. Yeah, he's about he's about halfway done, yes, Morty. Boy. Um, he's, he's already the longest. It's taken longer than anything else. He's fucking hard, <laughs> man. He's a hard thing to he's paint. He's a beast. I can't wait to. He's a fucking. I mean, beast. who's gonna win, Ragnar or Martarian? Uh... <laughs> I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. Obviously, Martarian. How many Mortarians have you been through, Ian? Uh, just the two, mate. 100. Just the 200. Just the two. <laughs> How many wings of Mortarian have you been through? Uh, approximately three pairs. <laughs> uh, it's the longest running joke ever. Should we, should we explain <laughs> the joke? <laughs> what was the joke? Go the, for it. I, I painted so him. The, the joke is that you bought three Mortarians. No, not not three Mortarians. I bought two because you've been on you you finish you finished one. Yeah. You finished the first one. You were unhappy with the face. I was so unhappy with got, the model. That got detailed. Yeah. And then you did the second one. You're happy with the wings, and then that got detailed. And then the third one has just been lost in the warp because no, he just he doesn't speak about it anymore. Yeah, I didn't know you speak about it. <laughs> we don't even know where that one's it's gone. It's because there isn't a third one. I've, the, I've only had two Mortarians, but I had three sets of wings because I got a set of wings spare because the first lot broke. And then I think in the end, I didn't like how he looked, so I got rid of it and just got another one because I think it broke as well because he's got such little fiddly parts on it, quite easy to break. That's a problem. Yeah. Come to think of it, I haven't seen Death Guard on the table for a long time for you, Ian. Um. I mean, obviously, I still love them, but Space Wolves are my one true love. So, considering Scott hey, has got Death Guard, like, and he's our main Death Guard player at the moment, it's not really necessary for me to use them as much. Don't, don't put me in a box like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I'm, I'm hoping to put you in a box, And the rest mate. of his Death Guard. When we have a battle, you're going in the box. Ooh. Ooh fighting talk. Ooh. Fighting <laughs> shots. God damn. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all about space holes, Bob, to be honest, mate, at the moment for me. Yeah. I mean, obviously with these assault intercessors and stuff coming out, it just adds more interest for me to start playing them constantly. Um, and with me just buying some Blade Guard as well, I'm looking forward to converting them um, and using them in an Impulsor. I can't work out what if I want to cram all my characters with the Blade Guard into the Impulsor, though. I'm sort of in two minds about that, so maybe a bit of advice would help. So what? You were worried that they would they'd be too vulnerable, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. Having three three blade guard and three characters. Yeah, I was just thinking. I mean, if you look at them and you think, do I want to target this intercessor squad or this assault intercessor squad in an impulsor, or do I want to target this other impulsor with three blade guard? Ragnar and like two other characters what you're not you're not going to think I'm going to take the intercessors down are you you're going to go for the blade guard and characters so I don't know yeah. if I need to get another impulsor what just to s- split fire and have three in one three in the other um 
No, well, just to do sort of the character thing, but sort of press ahead, be more aggressive with the intercessors and just proper shove them up in your face and then have the other one a little bit further back so you can sort of, sort of like, um, just throw so much stuff at you that you you can't target prioritise yeah. anything, really. Plus, um, the dome shield, hasn't that been changed to a five plus now instead of a four? That I didn't know. I thought it was still a four plus. I'm hoping it's I still it, a four I plus. I think, I feel like I've definitely seen somewhere that it's getting changed to a five and the points for it are going down, but I could just be making that up. But I'm pretty sure, I'm I'm pretty sure I have seen that. Oh, I hope not. So, <laughs> but for now, obviously, you're still using your codex and, and in your codex it says it's four, so for the game it will be four, won't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like Storm Shields, everyone's anticipating a nerf to that uh, but obviously using the rules as they are currently and it still uh, differs a 3 plus invulnerable doesn't it yeah so does it one thing I'm quite interested by actually now that you're mentioning the the storm shield changes obviously this will be part of the new codex release won't it yeah and um, obviously when that drops does anyone know when that happens when that's coming out. The new codex. Yeah. Is, is, didn't they say September, I want to say? Okay. So the new codex is for Space Marines will have Blood Angels, Dark Angels, Death Watch, and Space Wolves in that codex. So what do people think of that? Um, I mean, obviously, me and you can have the main opinions on it, James, being Space Wolves and Blood Angels. Um, I mean, I like it and dislike it at the same time um i mean i love it because it means that we will both get uh, updates um, and be able to get all the toys more than ever that what marines will get um and just get quicker rules updates and stuff but on the negative side it means that we sort of potentially lose our uniqueness with our units and just become more sort of vanilla if you will like normal marines are to us um, I mean, I don't know how you feel about that. Do you feel the same? I'm pretty excited. Um, for for a long time, I mean, I collect Blood Angels, and I've been used to the Marine Codex coming out and then having to wait a long time for my Codex. And I'm sure it's been the same for you, Ian, with Space Wars. Yeah. I think in the last edition, you were the last Marine Codex, were you not? Uh, what about Death Watch? Well, either that or... I think you were one of the later Marine Codex. Yes, I was, I, was, I was very late. Yeah, and I think it's nice now that from day one with Bless the Marine it. Codex, all of the essential stuff I'll have access to. And when normally, like a Blood Angel or a Space Wolf Codex comes out, after you get past the unique units, say like Thunder Wolf Cavalry or... Wolfen. Yeah, or Death Company for Blood Angels say um, everything else is just copy and paste so personally I would there's prefer a, to have there's another avenue for that though pardon there's, there's another avenue in so far as people that want to collect marines but they're not 100% certain on what chapter yeah. they want to go with yet they can still buy the Space Marine Codex take a good look at you know all the different chapters even those ones that would previously had their own separate chapter you know, see if if they take the fancy at the time when they're reading yeah, it definitely. before they even start painting. You know, you could build them up. You know, you start collecting box and still not have decided, but you've still got a codex yeah. and a start collecting yeah. box. That's a good point. See, actually, I didn't think about that. My, didn't oh. didn't they say that eighth edition codexes are or they may be relevant to? Yeah, they edition will be as well for the time being. Um, yeah. yeah. So I don't know whether you'll get a complete overhaul. So the plan with Marines, um, after the Codex comes out, is that all the supplements that came out in 8th edition towards the end of 8th edition for Ultramarines, Imperial Fists, Salamanders, their supplements will still be usable for the majority of 9th, is what I remember reading. Mm. And then your chapters like Blood Angels, Space Wolves, Dark Angels, they will then be gaining a supplement like those supplements that I've just talked about. And I'm quite excited for that because I felt there was more lore 
in those supplements for say Imperial Fists than there was in my Blood Angels Codex because in the Blood Angel Codex you had to put some of the maybe from the Blood Angel point of view but the key marine law that's in the Marine Codex so you haven't really got time to talk about all the different companies like you do in the supplements yeah when I was saying negatives in terms of um, uniqueness as a Space Wolf player until Primaris my army was pretty much entirely unique. I had loads of unique characters, unique troops like Grey Hunters and Blood Claws. Um, everything was like a, its own unique thing from the the uh, normal Codex Space Marines. And now there's Primaris, it gives you more chance than ever to have the ability to like work together with space marines basically you don't have to worry as much about the change of uniqueness there um what you're saying is is you're happy for space wolves to conform uh, to the codex not to follow the codex <laughs> yes but I, I want that i would like the benefits from the codex <laughs> i want all of uh gulliman's and carl's new toys double standards <laughs> take it or leave it take it or leave it definitely you get this extra benefits so I guess Blood Angels don't... I kind of always felt... Blood Angels divert from the, the Codex, but nowhere near as much as Space Wolves do. Um, I mean, I, I don't... I'm not... I wouldn't class myself as a big Dark Angel player, but Dark Angels are a chapter that I've loved the lore of, and I've collected miniatures over the last few years, and I've been painting a lot of them recently. And with the new Indominus box, the Blade Guard in there have been painted up as Dark Angel First Company. Yeah. And for a long time now, the first company of the Dark Angels, the Deathwing, has usually been completely Terminator armor. So that's something that I think in the early editions of Warhammer, Dark Angels did have a lot of Deathwing units that weren't Terminators. But for a long time now, it's been quite standard that they are. And I think I've seen a lot and spoke to different Dark Angel players that have felt a little uncomfortable yeah. with that. But I think it's the sort of thing as time goes on and, you know, Marines will always get new units. It will probably feel very natural in a couple of years. I mean, at first I wasn't sure about Primaris, but I'm quite excited to uh, paint some Blood Angel Primaris in the future because I'm still quite a strong firstborn player with them. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry, Cam, were you... No, gonna... you go ahead, Scott. You go ahead. No, 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 no. I was, I was slightly changing the subject, so... Well, I was just going to go on the back of what James said about um, new units for Space Marines. I'm a bit tired, to be honest. Space Marines have yep. had so much recently. Um, what a little Xenos player you are. Yeah, but come on, you can't say you're not feeling the same for your Eldar. No, don't get me wrong. Um, um, like Tyranids I did, I did or another. I some of the stuff for Marines, I think, the other day. And, you know, it was the Phobos stuff last year. Yeah. Brilliant miniatures. But, yeah, the gr don't get like me wrong. Said, great miniatures, like. The, I mean, it's. I don't awesome. feel like there's an equivalent for Marines at the minute. Yeah, so I was I was going to add to that. Obviously, we've got the the heavy um, intercessors coming, haven't we? Which we've seen leaks of. Um, which look like they've got like a fucking massive. Sorry, which look like. <laughs> I'll say that again. Which look like they've got a massive gun, that, and it looks like they're in squads of three, maybe because they might be a multi-part kit with the eradicators. Have you all seen this? Yeah, I have. Um, what, so you can mi mix and match. You mean? No, no. no so, so there'll be a multi kit, and one way of building it would be as the eradicators with the um, what they call melter rifles, or yeah. they can be. They might be. I don't know if this is this is just people kind of guessing, but they might be um, troop squads of three that have heavy bolt rifles. It looks like because it says right. there's an image of a captain, and it says cap. It says um, captain, primaris captain with heavy bolt rifle. And, well, I think I've seen and that. And he's in like he's in gravis armor, and his gun is is huge. Yeah, <laughs> that's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> just going back to uh, just going back to Cam. Uh, saying, you know, how he's sick of all the new releases for the uh, Space Marines. Does that not 
make you want to at least jump on board a little bit? Uh, I do a little, but at the same yeah, time, I feel like <laughs> everyone's got Marines somewhere. Yeah. Um, I just don't want to be a sheep, to be honest. If you were to pick Ooh. a chapter, if you were to pick I'm a chapter, a sheep, I'm a wolf. who would you go with? I've always liked the look of the Nova Marines, but I don't like oh, the yeah. idea of being a successor of Ultramarines. Um, the thing with Space Marines, not be it, like obviously they've got the the widest range of stuff. They're also like the cheapest army to get because they were in they're in every starter set. So I've yeah. I've got Imperial Fists, and the only reason I've got Imperial Fists is because. Well, they came with my Death Guard, and then there was that Space Wolf. Um, Space Wolf box was it with? Who was it with? Was it Gene Steelers? Oh, Tooth and Claw, you mean? Yeah, Tooth and Claw, and then I yeah. got that. And uh, did you have the? Someone else had the Gene Steeler Colts or something. I think it was you, Ian. Yeah, I've got Gene Steeler Colts. Yeah. No, but did you have it from that box, and I had the Marines? No, I think it was Justin, wasn't it? Oh, it might. Yeah, yeah, it might have yeah. been. So like. I already had a thousand points from getting half of two starter boxes that that cost me really not a lot of money, and to get a thousand points in another army, I probably would have easily had to spend about double what I spent there. So then I've just painted one up as Imperial Fist, and then it's like, oh, I guess I'm doing Imperial Fist now because it's like you just slip into it because it's so easy and it's so cheap. They're a game. Well, you're doing Imperial there. Fists because you love them. Yeah, but I originally... I do love them now, but I originally just thought, oh, I'll have a go painting these Imperial Fists because I've got a load of Marines. They're sitting around not doing anything. I don't really right. want to sell them. I do want them. <laughs> but I didn't I didn't specifically be like, I really want a Space Marine Army because I didn't want a Space Marine Army. I wanted to avoid them, to be honest, like Cam. But they're just See, there and it's easy. It just sucks you in. Thing it is, does. most people that got like Dark Imperium... Um, yeah. Like tooth and claw and stuff, they use it as an easy access. And to the, get, the chaos like, one, like say well. a large space marine force. The chaos one with all the pho- phobus armor. Like yeah. if you if you bought tooth and claw, dark imperium, and um, what was the chaos one called? Shadow spear. Shadow yeah, spear. You get you take the marines for those three. You've got a pretty. You can make a pretty solid one thousand points out of that. And and even more if you if you don't want to be too competitive. Yeah. So like, I mean, what are you Vigilus, spending there? Really, you're spending less than a hundred quid probably. When Vigilus was the campaign that they were building up, they did release quite a lot of boxes that had a Xenos army and then yeah a Space Marine army. Yeah. And then when they got to Vigilus, they did the Shadow Spear box, and then now we we've, we've got Ninth Edition. About a year after that, we have another. Space Marine box with, I mean, they're they're the poster boys, aren't they? Space Marines. No, yeah, they're not going to be. Is it? I think it's so easy to collect <laughs> a Space Marine army, and there's there's kits I've got that like, I bought the box for Eldar or something else, and I'm like, yeah, w- wake wake the dead. Yeah, that's another that's another one. That's a fourth one. Wake the dead. Yeah, exactly. Wake the dead was one. I bought that one. Yeah. Um, there's such a it's such a hot topic right now though, like. Obviously, you've just got massive debates raging about. Uh, obviously, Xenos players are really upset how much limelight Space Marines are getting and have always got. And you've got like old Eldar models which are like twenty plus years old, just like sat in fine cast, not getting an update. Yeah. And then you've got just Marines getting churned out constantly. I can see why it upsets people. To be honest, it would make you think to yourself, why do I bother collecting this faction? when everyone just is just going to jump on the Space Marine bandwagon just so they can get all these new toys all the time. Yeah, but people protest yeah. with the Percy, and don't they, at the end of the day? And if, if people are going to just yeah. keep buying Space Marines because they're always getting updates, then they're always going to keep getting updates, and yeah. they're going to be consistently the most popular force it's to play. It's a cycle, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's true. I think with the Indomitus box, most people are painting up the Space Marine side. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think the Necrons are some of the best miniatures that they have um, made over the last number of years. Um, it's beautiful. Well, the cast, the cast in general, chat? are just like that nowadays. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they, they they have increased a lot 
over the years in terms of how good the poses are and how dynamic yeah, everything definitely. is. It's so much yeah. better. How everything is how everything is leaping off a rock now. How many of us are painting <laughs> new Marines versus the new Necrons in this chat right now? I haven't bought a box, so I wouldn't know. I have well, not bought I've, one. I've got I've got both, but I've, but I've got. I've got um Greek. I've got even more Necron so. <laughs> <laughs> Well well it's three out of five, isn't it? I mean yeah. Scott has got it for both factions. I've got really. it for both Me and you, James, I have got so... way more Necrons. Like I've got sixty warriors, I've got three of those walkers, I've got nine of the um scorpion things. Yeah, but you're a long time Necron player, of course you'd want the new Necrons. Yeah. But you've got the obviously you want the space marines as well for your fists. Yeah, because the the yeah, because like the shield guys definitely fit for the fists, and so I definitely yeah, want do. them. I think Black Templars like look really good with this, you know, with with Indomitus. Like I think Blade Guard especially just perfectly fit the aesthetic of Black Templars. Yeah. What's your favorite model in the box? My favorite. Yeah. Um. I'd probably say my favourite unit is the Assault Intercessors. Um, for years, I wanted like a dedicated, like Assault inter- like an Assault Troop Squad, uh, to use with Space Wolves and much, much, much later. You know, Grey Hunters and Blood. I had Blood Claws, but with only one wound. Seventy-five years later. You know, or or you put. Like, for example, they can be quite slow unless you put them in a transport. Come on, answers on a postcard. What's your favourite model? Uh, the Assault Intercessors. Smashing. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be a one-word one word, um, question given to everyone. What's your favourite model, Scott? I would say the... the um, what, what the fuck's it called? Canoptic... Um, Reanimator? What the fuck? What's it called? Yeah. <laughs> that's that the name of it. Like so many different things. Like, it, like at times I look at it and think, oh, it reminds me of something out of War of the Worlds. Yeah. Or at times I think, yeah, like, I get that. Like everything, like a big Necron, like a, maybe like out of the Matrix. You know those that carries the baby. Um, you know the the fields of humans they have. The, yes. Those, oh yeah. Definitely yeah. Um, so with with Necrons, like. So I've had them since fifth, and that's back when they were. So the laws changed each time. Well, I don't know if it's changed that much this time. I've not really read enough up, up enough about it. But um, the first kind of wave is like they're just robots, and that's it. Obviously, there's not a lot of personality with that. So then the second wave, which was was it fifth or sixth, that was kind of turning them into um, like the dynasties and giving them personalities and like hierarchies not like everyone's every single one's a dumb robot giving them actual hierarchies and now with this new phase it's like we're bringing it back to to like the grim darkness of it and like the horror aspect of it because everything looks like like they've just turned up the horror of it and they've kind of they've forgot the whole dynasty royalty thing that's still there but they've kind of left that yeah, and been like, new... let's make them the, the horror army. Let's make H-H-Q. them like the Night Horn in Age of Sigmar. Let's make them like that. Which I fucking H- love. Hugh, that's the Royal Warden, is that right? Yeah. Does that kind of tie in with the dynasty? It Yeah, yeah. I, so. Yeah, no, you're right. It does. It does. But like the warriors now look like like skeletons, really. Yeah. Which I do love. And then the the walkers are just... There's just something wrong with the way they look. They just look evil, and it does it does remind you of War of the Worlds and like what you said with the like the Matrix kind of like robots and like it doesn't look like they should be able to stand up. They just look wrong, and I, I love that look of yeah. it. So that's why it's my favorite one. It's interesting you should say that. You know, like that they've um, increased in. The, the grim dark aesthetic when most of the artwork has been a bit more pop arty if you will such as That's the, true, uh, yeah. the new logo yeah I mean yeah. even the, even a lot of the artwork is very very vibrant if you look at like the new 
uh, cover for yeah. the Codex for the Space Marines, for the example. Yeah, it's very even, even the Necromon, I'd, I'd argue, was like quite quite um, vibrant and colourful yeah. compared to the older Necron Codexes. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the play is with them on that, to be honest, whether it's just about trying to make it look bright and vibrant to catch more people's eyes or it's just yeah. a, a totally change in the way that they want to market it. But I, I, don't, I don't have anything against the the new artwork at all. I think it looks nice. It's it's very well drawn out. I know there's a lot of controversy on it. Um, some people really dislike it. Um, but I, I haven't got anything bad to say about it. What does everybody else think? I I I completely agree. I think I think the artwork and the imagery is getting a bit more accessible because um, obviously we've got like kids books and stuff. But I think the models themselves they haven't gone that direction. I think the models themselves have just got better and and more grim dark, if anything. Yeah. Mm. But like everything around it, the packaging, the artwork, um, the the artwork on the codexes, they've gone more brighter and accessible yeah. which is why some i think some people are complaining but if you look at the models themselves i don't think any of them have gone like less grimdark I no yeah, i think that. um what they're doing in terms of artwork and packaging and things like that is actually good for the company um you know it'll attract them younger audiences that don't yeah. really see it as you know being fun you know, it can kind of put younger children off, um, so it makes it a bit more advertising to them. Um, yeah, as well, if you look at it, you know, that's a good point, because if you look at what's popular for kids nowadays in terms of war stuff, if you look at how popular Fortnite is... Yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, that that's a very bright game, and thousands yeah. and thousands of kids, millions of kids probably play uh, Fortnite, and it's been around for a while. Maybe they've sort of seen that trend because it, you know there's plenty of games out like PUBG and Call of Duty Warzone and all the other battle royales that came out. They're probably not as played heavily by kids as Fortnite is, and that's probably down to how vibrant it is. So maybe they've yeah. took a leaf well, you, out of that book and sort of gone. You had Overwatch as well, didn't you? Overwatch and Fortnite were sort of like yeah. real big. Yeah. yeah sort of shoot them up games and they were both have very cartoon aesthetic towards them yeah maybe maybe that's the front on it then maybe that's what it is i've, I've read a couple yeah. of the kids books actually they, they're quite good um I, I don't think that you lose anything in terms of the storytelling and uh, you know when you if you've read like the other standard black library books it can be quite hard to follow for, especially if you're you know a lot younger yeah, but it's the, extremely the dense. very easy to, to follow even the fact that they're so easy doesn't even make it a, a point where I get bored reading it because I'm quite happy to read it to him that's good mm. yeah that's good yeah I mean like we've been saying it for years like the the universe is unlike anything else because it's insanely dense yeah, so massive. like that makes it not particularly accessible yeah um, especially yeah. with like space marine stuff, because um, you you got like thousands of years of history and and names and all this stuff in the past, and that's before you even get into other races. Um, don't really know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> <laughs> but I get what you mean. Like the it's, it's is, is is your opinion like? Are you saying it in terms of someone that's get, trying to get into the hobby? Like it's so dense that like they struggle to pick what sort of faction they want yeah. to roll. Yeah, in. yeah. So then, so then that's why they make everything all bright and everything like we've been saying. Well, let's take let's take um, I don't know, like a ten year old girl. You know, yeah. um, their where dad you taking takes her? them to? Careful, that's where illegal. You taking her? taking, <laughs> taking minors is uh, it's a crime. <laughs> you know, the father takes them to um, his local Warhammer shop. Yeah. Um, show you know give give her an insight into his his passion um <laughs> <laughs> sorry oh dear sorry very, this is very bad choice of words it's getting worse <laughs> no, I, get, I get where you're going though keep going well, you, you know what i mean don't you you know if yeah if all if she walks in and all she sees is like bloody box work and all this grim dark it's kind of, it's never gonna catch 
in my yeah, opinion. That's a really good point. Uh, yeah, it that is, is a good point. That's that. a, yeah, that's a very yeah, good point. Yeah, whereas if it's a bit sleek, a bit soft, no, it's not working. This. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Like your points are very, very accurate and valid. I mean, like you say, a ten-year-old girl isn't going to look at the old sort of. Uh, well, 40k or or even the uh, fantasy slash Sigma boxes, yeah. and she's not going to think they look appealing to me. I think some of the Sigma uh, because... boxes have good artwork. You know, it's it really pops out. I think. I think Sigma. Yeah. The I mean, white box, I think, really pops. Yeah, yeah. Sigma have sort of have nailed it for being colourful and 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 fantasy. Uh, 40k is a lot more grim dark, even with the update. I think it's still more grim dark than yeah. People complain that the, way... the um sorry the new video, you you know the first one that they released uh, for the Indomitus yeah, they... yeah. People complain that that wasn't grim dark enough, but I thought it was. I thought it was brilliant. Oh, it was you brilliant. see, you know, you see a guardsman get vaporized. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the the point is I don't mind. I don't mind this game, the entry point for this game being for children. That doesn't bother me. But you've got all this depth around it, and you've also got like crime novels and horror novels coming out, which are pretty messed up. I mean, I'm yeah. I'm reading one of them at the minute, at the one of the um, horror ones at the minute. There's like three separate stories, um, and it and it does read like a standard horror, and obviously that's not for children. But that's fine because it's it's as long as your entry point is for children, it's got and got these bright, inviting artwork and color and whatever, and these children's stories. But then you've got horror stuff, and then these models that are sometimes messed up and grim, dark, as we say. Then that's good. I think it gives a good yeah. option, doesn't it? Really, on a on a whole. I, I think I, what I like about the word grimdark is I have an idea of what it means to me but it's such a unique word to Warhammer I think a lot of the time everyone has a different version of what grimdark is to them it's down yeah, to our own perception. it's all perceptional mm-hmm. yeah so when people get in these heavy debates about it not being grimdark enough or it is grimdark enough I sometimes get a bit lost if I'm honest I'm like yeah it looks gothic to me you know I'm done well See there yeah. straight off the hand, you know your. It sounds like your perception of grim dark is gothic. Um, now for me, yeah. it's not really that. I see it as being dark and musty and dirty kind of thing. Just, just like a hopeless time where it doesn't matter what you do or who you are. You're um, carrying a you're gun nothing, or carrying coal. Yeah, you're nothing but um, but food for the meat grinder, yeah. really. You don't have a purpose. It's not like today's world where you think to yourself, I sort of have a, a purpose. I can go for this job. You know, I'm, I, I know I can get married, blah, 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 all that lot. Whereas in those times, it's sort of like you don't, any second from all the threats going, you could just die straight away. There's nothing that, that you've got as a path to go for. There's another thing, isn't there? Like there's emotionally grim and dark. Yeah. Not just aesthetically. But it's, I mean, you've got the Imperium, which is like this galactic, dystopian, flipping, horrible empire, which will kill you without a second thought, and that's a place you're supposed to live and fight for. This is why, Ian, you should join the greater, the greater good. Yeah. <laughs> what, so it can be brainwashed as well? Well, at least you'll <laughs> live a happy life, mate. You join join uh, join Farsight and you're not so brave. Happy life, happy on, life in on, ignorance. On that point, Cam, how great or good do you think Tower going to be in ninth? Um, I don't know. I'm a little worried for um, the players out there that like to play. You'll like this, Ian. Trip tide. Um, <laughs> I'm a little worried for that because Shield drones are now 15 points, which is, in my opinion, very expensive. What were um, they before? They were ten points before. Um, wow, well, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah it's a um, big increase that. So I think gun drones and marker drones are going to be more widely used. Um, 
I mean, I think gun drones are good anyway. Uh, if you get a one, do you think that gives Tau more of a reason to be more gun heavy than defensive? With them, be, with their defense drones being more expensive, do you think that's going to affect it in that way? Or well, I, I'm not too sure. I think people are going to try and stick to the ways. Um, Stand, standing at the back of the board. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of Tau players are used to that. You see, I used to do that, uh, but now I'm quite heavily into far sight. Yeah. So. Which is the complete opposite, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that, could you that not offset the? Could you not offset the loss of the shield drones by just taking loads of shield generators on? Uh, like, for example, crisis suits. They can all have a shield generator. They can, they? yeah, but. I think um, a shield generator can cost different points on different units. Is it more expensive than a shield drone? Not necessarily. Um, right. I'll be honest with you, I've not actually checked up on that, the points cost of a shield right. generator. Um, but even so, I imagine it'll probably... It, I, I think they would have gone up a little bit, but they'll still they still might be a bit cheaper because, you know, you still risking taking that damage on that actual unit whereas you can offset it to a shield drone and still yeah yeah you know um, um move moving on um uh, what what's everyone going to miss most about the eighth edition um uh seizing seizing the initiative no oh. <laughs> the amount of times I've seized the initiative, including my latest battle with Jord, just as like a final farewell to Ape, I seized against him. And considering he was using Triptide list, I, I thought I was going to get absolutely destroyed. But seizing managed to allow me the opportunity to get up in his face and dictate the battle a lot more. Whereas obviously now in ninth, you can't seize anymore, can you? It's a good one. So that's going to change it I mean, for I me. would argue that's an improvement though, but... Yeah, I would say it's an improvement because it is a ball ache if someone seizes off you. Um, it just sort of makes you think, did you actually win by sort of... Yeah, seizing um, is quite high-end. Winning the roll-off. Anybody else? I, I, honestly, I don't think there's anything... I can't think of anything on the top of the head that I'll miss. I've only, I've only I haven't actually played ninth yet, but I've witnessed... <laughs> um, I've only witnessed one game or two. I've only witnessed one game, and for what I can see, it's way more tactical. It's way better. The I think the secondaries is the best thing that they've added. The secondary objectives is the best thing they've yeah. added. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's well. You'll see in this Tower uh, Night Lord game that is going to come out soon. The the way that Cam and Ben play is definitely different. And how they would have played that game in eighth, and it's it's interesting. It's 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 better for it, I think. Yeah, I, I feel the same as you, Scott. Um, the I felt there was a bigger change between seventh and eighth than there is between eighth and ninth. So I felt very much that when eighth happened, it took seventh and went right. We're going to completely redesign this game. Whereas with ninth, it looks very much more like they've gone. What worked in 8th, what didn't work in 8th. And they've either scrapped or changed or just tweaked slightly the things that didn't work. And then everything that has worked, you know, you look at the way data sheets are now. It didn't used to be that it would say you roll a 2 plus to hit or a 3 plus to hit in combat. It, it used to be, uh, what was it, weapon skill 5 and you had all these different codes, didn't you, in 7th? Yeah. Really yeah. Remember, but... De- well, it depends on what their weapon skill was to what yeah. your weapon skill was as well. And things like that are the same. And I just think it looks like a much slicker version of 8th. Yeah. And I'm very happy with the change in command point generation now. That was something I didn't like about 8th. It looked like you could kind of rig it to just farm command points. Whereas now it's you, you make a list and it feels a bit more like you've got to really think about where you're putting in, in your list. You know, do I need to have this many heavies actually because I'm spending so many CP to generate more yeah I think in, in I think that's great but in some ways it it um, it hurts armies that are that HQ heavy especially like Ian Space Wolves and yeah. making a Necron list with like the Royal Wardens and stuff I was I was struggling to to get in what I wanted in my with HQs the Royal 
can you take two in one slot or is it no you can't no, like you can do the lieutenant you can't that's a bit frustrating could be something they change i don't know this is scott just going back to sorry cam what you were saying about hq scott then in terms of it being harder for certain factions like mass space wolves um in a in a typical battle in eighth i'd be running like a battalion with three HQ maxed and then I'd run a either a vanguard with a couple more characters or a supreme command with like three more characters I'd be spamming hero hammer uh, because the synergy what my characters had with my other units in terms of even um, like the deed of legend from the warlord traits where if you make your warlord trait you can pass it on to units that are nearby that was amazing but the less uh, HQ I can take, the less chance of synergy that I can get. And it, allow, it means that I have to rely more on my elite options than ever to do the job that the HQs used to do before. I think that's a good thing, to be honest, because uh, it works out for law as well as tactical yeah. nows. Um, yeah. Well, it might do for you, but not apart, for me, because my hand has always been about myself, one man can turn a battle. Um, which are an elite squadron of commanders um i don't think mm. i don't think you'd get many armies that would generally feel field a load of characters no yeah. but you know? the the problem happens is when you've got kind of like these weird sub hq units that don't really fit like a full-on hq like you've got the supporting hqs which almost could be elites so then you've got the issue of should they really be hqs or should they be elites like there's certain buffing units that that Lieutenant, are fairly weak, example, yeah. yeah. That that could quite easily be moved to elites. So then it's like, yeah, I, that's a good idea. Considering my HQ list is like rocking probably over thirty options, hmm. um, it's a bit stupid that I could only take three max, you know, and anything more starts to like, you know, hurt me. Yeah, basically. Then the other way is that can obviously be abused quite a lot. So mm. I do, I do like, think it's better. It's a weird well, one. I, I always feel like it's a bit of a funny one. Where do I put my commissars, and where do they fit in? Yeah. You know, it, it's sort of like it's a HQ, but it's not really a HQ. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel yeah. like that a lot of a guard struggle with that as well with decent HQs. I think that, and a lot of the way to play guard has to be an absolute ton of bodies or a lot of heavy armor, and you don't really so much rely on your HQs. I think the most important things are stuff like your tank commanders and your company commanders for isu uh, uh, issuing orders, but yeah. they're not. I don't. I don't think of them in the same way as like. When I play my ultramarines, I have HQs which play a specific role and have their own special rule set. I think of them just like, you know, standard blokes, but they have one special Yeah, I know what you mean. They're not particularly strong. You know, it's not like like a, a captain in Gravis armor, you could stick that up, up the field in someone's face and smash the face in. You know, it's it's a good, strong standalone unit just as itself. Whereas things like commissars or your company commander, yeah. he's just literally there to issue orders, and that's his strong point. Yeah, that that's that's the main problem because the the spectrum of HQs goes from a unit that's a one man army to a guy that gives a slight buff to someone else that's near him, but is kind of weak. Yeah. So it's like yeah, just a bit naff on putting his own. putting all, putting that entire spectrum into one um, one unit choice. It's quite difficult because yeah, it's like what some armies it hurts a lot. Some armies don't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. I do think when Codex is come out for ninth, though, you'll start to see certain detachments, maybe maybe new detachments that certain armies can take. Like uh, one thing yeah. I've noticed is that. Um, so if you look at Eldar and you look at uh, Adeptus Mechanicus as well, it, law-wise, it's quite normal for an Admet army to have, say, a battalion and then also take an Imperial Knight as a auxiliary. And it's the same for Eldar. You, you, you could get a battalion of Eldar with 
a Wraith Knight added on. But if you do that currently, I'm pretty sure that the super heavy auxiliary, you don't get any benefits from the army special rules, even if they're the same detachment. I don't yeah. think there's the synergy there anymore. And I, I kind of just feel that's something that they would look at later on. And I, I think it's the same, you know, you're talking about Imperial Guard. I, I kind of feel like you might get a chance, like maybe the way lieutenants are, you know, you can take two lieutenants in one slot. Maybe they'll start to introduce that to other yeah. armies if they haven't got it already. I'd, I'd like that. Hmm. I will definitely. It reminds me of the end of 7th. Do you remember when they had like the sort of detachment things like Decorians and things like that? Yeah. You had you could take unique detachments for your army uh, and unique units as well. I mean, you were sort of locked down, weren't you, with, with detachments with what units you could take, but they'd give you a buff in relation to what you were taking, which I liked. And if they did something a little bit like that, give you like your own ability to take a unique detachment to your faction that'd be sick yeah like it, to allow me to take more hqs would be awesome for it got me. to a point where those though where if you if you didn't bother taking one of them you'd be at a disadvantage because some of the buffs were yeah. so powerful yeah. and so easy to fill out the units for that if you weren't taking it you you were playing a list that was worse I remember yeah. necrons had a really nasty one yeah we, we had the one that increased it increased basically made cryptex pointless so you never had to take cryptex because every everyone had four plus three animation protocols so there's no point in cryptex anymore so there you're saving points and everyone's all mm. they're so hard to kill personally i think it's i mean two minds about uh, the hit modifiers uh, obviously everyone hated Eldar how stupid it was how much they could get hit modifiers um, whereas you know for the positive side of that for my army as a close combat army you need to get up quick whereas you know as again as a close combat army when you're trying to get up quick if you haven't got the defence to keep your units alive you're not going to make it and you're not going to have the units which are good which you want to hurt a bit available to do the job whereas um now they've capped it you sort of can't stack the modifiers to allow that to happen more i'm not sure i understand what you're saying there i don't know if if it was a bit of a tangent that you talk or what yeah it was a bit of a tangent basically what i'm trying to say is the modifiers the positives and negatives to me, the negatives were in terms of Eldar when you could stack it to like ridiculous so the point where you couldn't yeah, hit yeah. them. And the positives for myself, my army, is as a combat army, you need to get up close and you want as much stuff alive as you possibly can to get there and do the job. And having the hit uh, modifier buffs allowed me to do that. Whereas now, because it's stacked, it means that I've got to think more than ever about what is going to make it into combat because I can't have as much defensive sort of buffs to give my units. So, Bob, yeah. let's talk about your main playing armies and how you feel about them coming into this new edition. Well, I've sort of got two armies that... That are like the main ones. I've got quite, a f I've got quite a few armies, but I've not really played much with the Mechanicus, yeah. or uh, I haven't used the the Knights much. But uh, the main, the main armies that I've played with are my Ultramarines, the Primaris ones, and the Imperial Guard. And to be honest, uh, Ultramarines had a lot of flack in 8th edition with Gulliman for being just castling him up around him being a gun line yeah. um, but that was never really the way I played it anyway and in all honesty I, I haven't like done a lot of reading into the to the ninth rules to see how much that would actually change anything but given off like what I have seen and, and what you guys have talked about from yeah, Gulliman's got some interesting changes, <coughs> actually. I need to, I need to really look this. into it to be honest, but um, I, I can't see. He it doesn't seem like the powerhouse that he was. Too much of a difference to my playstyle. So, yeah, sorry, Scott. he doesn't seem like the powerhouse that he was. 
kind no. of. Um, no. I think he's still strong, but he was kind of like a must pick, and yeah. now I don't think it's so much that. Yeah, you could go with Calgar and a lieutenant now, and I feel you would get a similar benefit the buffs that you have. Yeah, yeah and yeah, but I, I think the the cool thing with Calgar is he's still an absolute beast. Yeah, you know, well, he should be. He should be. Yeah, um, I think personally for me, playing against Ultramarines, um, the one change I'll. I'll I'll tell you about is um, the change to the command point reroll. Have you seen much of that? No. Oh yeah, this this is good. Yeah. So, bef- yeah, before um, say an eighth, you could um, be fighting Gulman or shooting Gulman, and say you're defending and you're you're rolling your saves and um, you fail a save and you go, hmm, should I command point reroll it now and try and make that save to keep him alive? And then you think, well. Obviously, his armor gives him a four plus. He can come back to life. You might save the reroll for that, but then you get the four plus, so you, you bring him back. So you don't need to use the reroll, but then you've still got the reroll for how many wounds you're gonna have. Yeah. 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 So before you say, if you rolled a one, you'd use your command point reroll to reroll that, and you might get a six. Yeah. I used to find playing against Gullum and that had happened quite a lot. Yeah. But the way they've changed the command point reroll now is they've worded what you can use it for rather than saying you can reroll one dice. Right, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. So it's only for specific actions. Yeah. Mm. So you can't you can't reroll him coming back. And you can't reroll the amount of wounds yeah. he comes back with. Yeah, so you, so you can't be necessarily as aggressive with him as maybe you once was just for fear of losing him. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean that's you can re-roll his save. That is, I mean, that's fair enough. At the end of the day, he, he he was, like you say, a powerhouse, but I don't think that it necessarily is going to change the way that I play with him. How, um, how do you play with yeah. him? Well, I, I've always played more aggressively because I felt like he should be leading from the front. You know, he he's the beast. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? It's not, he's not supposed to be sat at the back like a girly man. Yeah, um, you know, <laughs> he's supposed to be up there, and and sticking his big sword where the sun don't shine. You know what I mean? Yeah, that and that and that's what Gulliman's about. You know, and and he's if he was to stand at the back and just be scared, he's not really inspiring greatness from the rest of his troops. So uh, that's the way I felt that he should be played. He should be played up front. He should be getting in in the face of people. At the end of the day, he's got he's got good combat uh, rules, and he's a, he's a very strong unit. I don't see a reason why he should just be left at the back just to be buffs. Yeah, that to me doesn't seem like an interesting game. It's like uh, Cam was saying he doesn't see the point of Tau being sat at the back just being a gunline army. It's boring for me. Yeah. Uh, well, it depends how competitive you play. I mean, you you and can play more thematically, so you want to play more sort of to your personal tastes and be more aggressive with them. Whereas, um, I think in competitive wise, you probably do work better sat at the back and with Tau and Gulliman does work better just buffing Ultramarine units up. I'd say I'd say as yeah. a group, we we mostly go down that route we go for theme and like what's fun what feels like what f- what does it feel like this unit should be doing and that's how i want to play it because it's yeah. it's fun i want my big guy leaning at the front like smashing face i don't want him sat at the yeah. back it's the same yeah. thing with with my crawlers and shooting it's like i want them to be artillery all lined up at the back because it just it looks cool it's it's thematic and that's and that's where they should be yeah. yeah and that's that's the way a lot of us enjoy to play so we we might not always make the correct um competitive move but i think i personally enjoy to play that way so yeah we don't tend we don't play competitive not, though no. do we? we we tend to just play for fun and play semi competitive yeah. at best really um I think you can get sucked into the competitive side and you know it's too expensive to be constantly chasing certain units and then getting rid of them once an FAQ or chapter pre drops and they, they get nerfed it's easier just to collect an army and units that you like the look of and how they play for you and they just you know build a list around that isn't yeah. it it's what will keep you in the game longer come on James tell us about yours Okay, um, 
playing wise so playing wise I've got two main armies um, the first is Blood Angels and the second is Eldar I can't see for me looking at it Blood Angels is going to change drastically I feel like a lot of the ways I like to play them which is quick movement uh, getting into combat and holding down on objectives I think a lot of that will stay the same um, but one thing I'm excited to do is uh, so for a long time I haven't painted any Primaris for my Blood Angels but they're pretty much next on my list of things to paint and I'm really excited for that because I've been meaning to get some for a while but now that the new assault based Primaris has dropped I think they're perfect to go in there so maybe it'll change slightly I'll, I'll have to see I feel like Eldar are going to change quite dramatically so usually in 8th edition as Ian's kind of touched on a little bit that kind of modifiers to make it really hard to be hit taking flyers or taking shining spears was usually the meta way to go personally I'm a Yandan player so I like to play with wraiths but I think what will change for me is wave serpents I feel like transports are going to be dramatically different in this edition with locking down objectives I mean I, I, I guess yeah. for different armies it might be differently um, and not as dramatic but for Eldar I feel like the wave serpent's going to have a bit of a different role than it did so usually in 8th a wave serpent you'd take three shuriken cannons and you'd take your troops or maybe a heavy elite unit like wraiths and kind of shoehorn them around the board and get lots of shots out but with the changes to being able to move and fire heavy weapons I think you'll see a lot more missiles or bright lances on wave serpents now and I also think underneath you tend to upgrade to a, um, a shuriken cannon but the the standard catapults like no points now whereas it was always a bit awkward it was always like two three points in the previous edition so making lists are a bit yeah. annoying. I hate it when you get those lists that are like 1,996 points, you know? Yeah, just a bit <laughs> You just want it to be 2,000. Yeah, I hate it when you kind of get to like 1,991 and it's like, I could have took a 10-point upgrade then, but yeah. no, I can't. <laughs> um, My list annoyed me how mine changed. Mine went from 2008 or 1999, and then it's changed to like 19... I think it was 1951. Yeah. So I've had to add loads of stuff in that I wouldn't necessarily do to make up the 2k quota. Yeah. But I think what would be good with Way Serpents now is um, they'll just be like, they always were like really good transports. And, and personally, I've always taken Way Serpents. I think they're a great unit, but I kind of look at it now and think I'd rather take more of them than Flyers. Yeah. Whereas it was definitely the way around before. Well, it was flyer spam, wasn't it, in 8th? Yeah, I mean, I've only ever run two flyers in lists because I just yeah. thought it was a bit silly having, like... I mean, some people would take, what was it, four or five? I just thought... Yeah, like, loads. Man, when would you come across an army in law that played like that, you know? Yeah. Um, I can imagine, some like, an army possibly, like... Is it same hand? Is that how they're pronounced? Same they're all about speed, bikes. aren't they? Oh, was it bikes? I yeah. would have thought they would have had loads of flyers if any if any of the Eldar craft worlds. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's kind of how I'm seeing the changes. Um, I I mean, I'm not going to say wave serpents are going to be the the key unit, but I, I feel looking at getting to play in Eldar, that's the unit I'm really interested to see how it how it operates, and I might buy another one. Yeah. Yeah. Just touching back into the playstyle change again, um, I really like the change where you sort of, um, when you get into combat with a unit, uh, it can't easily fall back. I like the change that they made. I liked it how if you fall back, you sort of have to pay a premium penalty for it to be able to take the unit back. Because as a combat army, there was nothing worse than constantly trying to wrap a unit just so you could hold it in combat so you wouldn't get shot by the whole of your opponent's army when they fell back. And especially against armies like Ultramines where they only suffered, what was it, minus one to hit, I think it was, 
if they fell back. Sure, yeah. Like it's not really, yeah, it's not really. A, it wasn't a penalty for an ultra Rene army when they're re-rolling all the hits with Gulliman. You know, against me, like I feel like this now is a lot better where you have to pay command points Take to do it. Gulliman, hey, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, you just be, be, before too good. we go off on mad tangents again, let's uh, let's uh, talk about Scott's uh, data Very sheet, shoot. and then we'll wrap things up. All right. So so earlier today, um, the news news. Let me pull the head headlines. Come on, do it in do it like a news news report. report. Um, so earlier today, they. They've leaked the Fire Strike Servo Turret and the Invader ATV squad, so the little buggy thing. And yeah, um, yeah, I'll yeah. talk. The the most interesting thing is on the Invader one, but I'll talk about the Fire Strike one first, which seems pretty strong. So it's four power. Which how many points is four power? About. Is it about like? Lot. It's not even a no. hundred points, is it? It's probably like. Is it like eighty points or something? I think CSMT yeah, seventy or eighty, maybe. Um, so it's got yeah. it's got ballistic skill two plus. It's got a two plus save. It's got toughness five and five wounds, so it's fucking it's tough. And the guns on it, so the twin accelerator auto cannon, forty eight inches, heavy six, strength seven, minus one AP, damage two. Wow. And the twin Laz Talon, 24 inches, heavy 4, strength 9, minus 3 AP, and D6 damage. So it seems pretty well, that's good. good. Especially yeah. because it's, it's ballistic skills 2 plus. So you know, you're going to hit yeah. with them. And it's not a random yeah. amount of shots either. You're going to hit with all 6 auto cannon shots, which is a lot. Um, I would say. <laughs> I would say that the Laz Talon. Talon being 24 inches considering that the unit is immobile although it doesn't oh no it can move it can move three yeah, inches it's, it's not immobile so I'm quite surprised that it's got a last tunnel Talon on it rather last than cannon. it would have been last better time. with a last cannon yeah um, <laughs> like it needs to be better oh it would have been better it's, with it's the, the range cannon, really it's, yeah, it's I mean, the 24, 24 inches that screws good, you a little bit on the board but you do it weirdly has a three yeah. inch movement I, I don't understand that because it seems as a, as a fists player how do you feel about those units so like it means that you can sort of have those at the back and sort of play to law a bit more in terms of like fortifying yeah, a little definitely. bit definitely I think I would go for the auto cannon though um, just for the range because um, yeah. six six auto cannon shots, it's pretty good for something that nice. cheap. Yeah, that's good. Uh, well. Not only that, you've gone, you've you've started off with this this argument on it going, well, it's a uh, it's four power level. Yeah. But uh, but it would have been better with a last. <laughs> <laughs> it's the rain. That's that's the no only. No one's ever bad fully pleased, are they? <laughs> um, so that's why you I'd know, go auto. You know, you've gone. It's four power level. It's a two plus ballistic skill, but it's not gonna last. <laughs> no, it's it's good. It's strong as well. But right, I'll go on to the invader one, the buggy one. Um, Hit me. So nothing, nothing special about its stat line really. Um, what is interesting, which will will spark a lot of debate, is um, so you can take a multi melter option, right? So multi melters yeah. have changed slightly, so it looks like the rule for melter is changed. So multi melter says twenty four inches, heavy two, strength eight, minus two. four AP, D six. And then this is the important bit, it says when an attack made with this weapon hits the target that is within half range, the attack has a damage characteristic of D six plus two. So Ooh. instead of wow. it being oh that's nasty instead of it being yeah. um pick, pick the, the highest. highest it's d6 plus two so I imagine that is going to be the that way melt is going to go so that's a whole weapon type that's changed what do you think eradicators what? will change oh that's a good point so in Indomitus they're not they don't say that but they could in the codex I guess 
They're a different gun as well. I, I think they might do because it allows you to shoot twice if you see, shoot the same unit. So you'll they'll probably keep that ability, but they'll have the amount of short shots capped a little bit more. Eradicators use a different gun as well. They've got a melt rifle. I imagine if you gave yeah, that to rifle, Eradicators, yeah. I mean, Eradicators are already incredible. So giving it that... Mm. I feel like that would be too good. I, I do feel a bit like Melter is that gun that is the kind of um, armor destroyer at close range, and sometimes it doesn't really feel like that in the game. Yes, we yeah. Do. yeah, yeah. Having the plus two means, I mean, you're always going to do three damage, aren't you? Yeah. It doesn't carry the same weight as a as a las cannon does, does it? Not quite. Uh, um, no, but it's just a swingy, isn't it? Really. The D, D, I like that they've added the plus two with the D6 because it means that a lot of the time you'll be rolling the one and it's a bloody heartbreaking, whereas um, now obviously it's yeah. going to be a minimum it's of be three, three, isn't it? Three to, three to which eight. Which is really it? good. So Three to eight, yeah. Which is, yeah. Is, I mean, it's better. Eight is, is, is mega, isn't it? If you get a six, plus it's, you're jumping for plus, sure. Plus it's two... Let's not say anything to George because that guy rolls sixes for fun and he will decimate plus, us if he plus knows Plus it's us. two shots and I don't know if a multi-melter was two shots before. Was it heavy one or heavy two? Cause it... I, think, I think you've got a... It was, well, it was heavy, heavy two one so. multi-melter there. I've not seen the model but it, it sounds like it, on, the, on the multi-melter it's got like a, a twin. It's got like yeah. two. So that's also four power level. So... But I mean, if it has changed, like a general multi melter now is two shots. Holy yeah. Christ! I mean, in law, a multi melter is actually two melter guns put yeah. together. Yeah, it makes sense. That's what it is. You know, a melter gun is half the range of a yeah. multi melter, but a multi melter is just two of them sandwiched together, shooting yeah. at the same target. Right. We've gone on for some time now, so it's probably a good time to wrap it up. And Hang on, did we? Sorry. Just quickly, have you got the Necron? Um, yes. Should we, should we talk just about them? Go over those, just very quickly. Just quickly. Yeah, we'll quickly go over yeah, them because yeah, yeah. I, I think the that Melter thing was the main interesting part. Um, okay, so Knoptek Doomstalker. We also know uh, what that can do. So it's going to be a seven power level. So I think it's. I think we know it's one hundred and thirty points. Um, it looks good. I don't think you would take it over the. Uh, Doomsday Arc, though, just because it's it's technically the same thing. It's the same. It's, it's the same it. thing. Right? It's thirty points less, but you lose. Right. You your ballistic still goes to four plus, and annoyingly, the weapon is called a Doomsday Blaster, but it doesn't have blast. Now, if it had blast, I think this would be something that I'd always take. Um, I think the model looks absolutely incredible, so I'm probably going to get a few of them anyway and use them and run them. Tell me about the destroyer. Uh, no, this is the the Doomstalk of the Walker. No, I know. I want to talk. We'll about get the to destroyer. that, mate. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down, bro. That's why I'm here. Uh, so yeah, I just I just no, think it's James is just I just on think the it's weak because we don't have blast and we don't have ballistic skill three. It's ballistic skill four plus because it's a canoptic. Um, it does have a five plus invulnerable save, but it doesn't have living metal. So, yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see. I'll probably get one because it's beautiful. Uh, so, and then we've also got the heavy destroyer locust. Not also. This is the, the main, main one because this these things. <laughs> this is the boy. These things are nice. So, I th you've got enough models, James. Can't so, a th so it's four power. Never it's four power. Models, I think. Mate. I think they've said it's seventy points. Um, so you're paying. Basically, really? a locust heavy destroyer will be the same price as two heavy destroyers because heavy destroyers are still a thing. Um, you were no, fan of destroyers. I, they were, they were really our best them. units, but I hated the models, so I didn't have any. Um, these look amazing. Uh, so we get. So for the price of two heavy destroyers, the Locust heavy destroyer gets an extra wound, um, and then we've got two weapon options. So one Gauze Destructor, thirty-six inch range, heavy one, strength ten, minus four AP, and three D three damage. 
which is your anti tank is, is a that's, good. that's yeah. incredible. So yeah, that is good. Having three D three D three. I looked at this on the dice calculator. So three D three averages out at six damage, which is amazing. It's disgusting. Um, it is. Well, it's the highest possibility from a D six, isn't it? So it's it's yeah, obviously yeah. miles. Better. And then you've got. D- does it have a las cannon? It doesn't have a las cannon. <laughs> I'd so so that's your that's your anti tank. I'd say that's pretty damn strong. Um and then the other option is the enigmatic exterminator, which is same range, thirty six inches. The weapon type heavy three D three. So on average again you'll get six shots. And then it's got strength seven, minus one AP, one damage. So I don't uh, it's good. Six shots at strength seven minus one AP one damage for a seventy point model. I don't know. Horde armies, you do I well with it. The... Um, if you get unlucky on I that three three roll, though. Yeah, I, I think the the the, the former gun yeah, is the one. Yes. Play. And I just think like two of them, maybe yeah, three of them. You'd it's you'd like, find. Oof. Have they got an invulnerable No, it state? doesn't. You'd, you'd find your anti-infantry somewhere else, I think. Um, because I don't think yeah. you'd bother with this. I think what's cool now for the new Necron releases is like you can do a really cool destroyer theme. Yes. And you can have destroyers that are shooting. You can have destroyers that are close combat. Yeah. And it's going to be really cool. It's going to be, it's going to be so like... So basically... The um, for Eldar. Yeah, I was going to say that then. A ne- a Necron Wraith army. Yeah. Scary. And I'm really excited for the Void Dragon. Oh, yes. Yeah. That looks like an absolutely amazing that, That's going to be a what, beast. What is, the, what is the lore with that? I thought the Void Dragon was all about, like... I thought he was a Catan, which was, like, stuck on Mars or something. It was the Emperor that slayed him. Like, what's going yeah, on now? Like, who, who woke him up? I don't know. <laughs> Just bear in mind, we're on an hour 27 recording. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um... <laughs> That, that's what I mean. Like it's unless there's going to be some kind of story that's some big story that's going to happen on Mars because he's supposed to be the well, he's rumored to be the actual machine god that the that the Adeptus Mechanicus worship. Um, so, I mean, we know we've got a model. I don't think we've got any law on him as to why he's out or what he is. Be some he, he might just they might just be like oh he's a void dragon shard which that'll be probably be the case it'll just be a shard of him that isn't mm. currently on Mars. I, I think that opens up a lot of opportunities for other factions the fact that they're, they're diving into the shards there's something in the black library books that's always really caught my eye is these shards that i haven't really seen in the game yeah. there's some really cool ones that chaos interacts with yeah there's there's quite a few there's quite a few shards that and we've only got we've got old models for two of them, um, but there's there is quite a few, and it seems to it seems to look like on the model of the new this new Void Dragon, it's, they seem to be containing them with Blackstone, which is quite interesting. Ooh. So yeah. I could see that being how they do them in the future. Cool. Well, yeah. That's it. Before we get uh, before we get very law heavy, and this starts tying into podcast number two. Yeah. All about law. <laughs> is uh, that what it is? Probably, we should probably wrap it up. Um, so, so yeah, yeah th- th- nothing more to say. No final words on anything. Everybody's said pretty much what they need to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, the the video will be coming out for Cam's and Ben's bat rep. Hopefully, s- hopefully probably, Sunday. Probably before this podcast gets released due to the publishing. Yep. Um, so you should go and check that out on the uh, Wannabe Wargamers YouTube channel. Yes. Um, anybody got any other shameless plugs they want to stick in there for the Instagram perhaps, James? <laughs> no. <laughs> you want to shamelessly plug your Instagram that you've been moonlighting? <laughs> yeah, of course I do. Yeah. I think that went, no, I think but, that went uh, well. Yeah, I think I think it was all right. Um, we could announce the next um, video that we're going to do after the, the Space Wolf's Death Guard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, and also, you could say that there's a podcast coming up as yes. well for that. Oh right, yeah. Listen to this podcast to get news on the next podcast. 
Um, because we'll be doing podcasts on each individual bat rep that comes out. Uh, it's probably going to be uh, pre pre um, games. Yep. So we'll, we'll do those. We've got we've got the next uh, one coming up, but we should probably focus more on cams and bends because that's the next one. Uh, the next podcast will be uh, the the post one. Uh, Ian and Scotts. Yes. Um. So. Uh, get on the on the YouTube channel. Follow us on on Instagram. Wanna be war gamers, and uh, we'll we'll speak to you next time. See you later. Ta ta for now. See you, See you guys. guys.